Let's go to God in prayer to consider the spiritual man uh, again and, and look at some of the details of the thing. And we're going slowly because we are as detailed as Watchman Nee was in his spiritual man book. And, uh, so I consider his book spiritual man book one. So I was a spiritual man book two. Uh, and it continues uh, to explain uh, concepts of the spirit, soul, and body. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word. Let your word continue to be like a two-edged sword, piercing, dividing asunder soul and spirit, so that we can continue to grow in you and understand which part of us is which part. Uh, help us to understand our inner nature, our spirit man that is born again our uh, soul part which is our human nature and also to separate from the physical dimension of our body thank you for all your grace and your mercy upon our lives extend your mercy over each life father as we hear the word for we know your word is greatly respected in all the spiritual world all the angels and spirit beings stand at attention when your word is proclaimed when your word is taught when your word is read for heaven and earth will pass away, but your word will not pass away. We ask for the spirit of wisdom and revelation to open the eyes of our understanding, especially tonight as we look into the area of Sunai Desis, the conscience, and a part of our spirit, as we begin to see how it functions. We ask for clarity. We thank you, Father, that all things are in your word. Let your word be clear and make it simple to understand. And thank you, Father, for knowledge and wisdom that will flow forth as we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit to enlighten us in all the knowledge of God. Most of all, that we may walk closer with God, that we may love you even more, that we will worship and honor you, give you all the glory, worship and honor to which you always deserve, O Father of all living beings. We love you, Father. As much as you have loved us, we love you, we love Jesus, and we love all that you are, and we magnify you, Father. Thank you for all your goodness. We bless you and let the spirit of praise also take hold on each heart. In Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Amen. Again, I bring the chat to you so that you remember, and we always do that, especially in case anyone is first time here. Though we teach in a series, if you catch us at any point in the series, you will be able to catch something from that part of the thing. And uh, now, let's look at the old chart again, which is, I think, below. Old chart, new chart, yes. And, uh, oh, that's another thing, right? Uh, this is the new chart. The one where you wish to watch my knee one, yes. Yeah, there's the one, thank you. Now, this is the model that you have in Spiritual Man by Watchman Nee, uh, which I consider book one. So he considers um, uh, the spirit, the soul, and the body. And uh, so in Watchman Nee's definition, he doesn't say anything about the body, which we have discovered even in our modern world as knowledge has increased, that the body has its own memory system. The body also has its own a life of its own. Uh, the body. Uh, in the book of Romans, we have touched on the fact that the body seems to have a mind of its own. And Paul called it that, uh, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he talked about sin nature living inside his body, as if there's something alive living inside the body. And that is uh, the fallen body, uh, the sin nature that abides, which watch many does not cover. So we still say that the body has a certain level of mind, a certain memory of memory, a certain level of emotions. And even today, it's so easy to prove that the body has emotions. You know why? They can measure emotions today in the psychological world by analyzing the chemicals that you produce. Fear, adrenaline, oxytocin, endorphins, all these are chemicals in your physical body. So how can you deny that your body does not have its own emotions? Uh, you don't believe it, we're not going to do that. Yeah. We just inject you with a lot of endorphin and see what happens to you. It's like a drug. You'll find emotionally you know, uh, different things. Yes, your body does produce and have its own emotional, physical dimension. And this all knowledge has increased. See, the, the time when they study the Bible, uh, uh, knowledge was still coming in the natural world. But in our time, we have added it all and we look at the Bible in a different way. The good thing is we find that all these truths are in the Bible all the time. 
Uh, that's why the Bible talks about the body as a living thing of itself. Uh, and, uh, so the body has its own level of emotions, and the body seems to have its own passions and desires. It does. Uh, and uh, like it functions like another part of you. And that's where uh, uh, we have added that into the spiritual manual too. And these are the old things, uh, will, emotions, and the mind. And we always look at the, the soul man as having the will, the emotions, and the mind. Then Watchman Nee divides the dimension of the spirit with uh, uh, conscience, intuition, and communion. And uh, we'll redefine that. Uh, in this series, and all the messages that have been preached and catch up on it is already online. So you can look at it under the spiritual mind and message 1, 2, 3, 4. We go very detailed and we give you scriptural basis. We should redefine uh, these areas to show that when Jesus said the spirit is willing but the flesh is weak, he is referring to a will in your spirit. Otherwise, he wouldn't use the word spirit. He said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And that uh, tells you that your, your spirit has a will of its own. Also, I gave you 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 14 and 15. Paul says, I will pray with my spirit, and I will pray with the understanding. We thought that that was just a soul will. But you look very carefully, it's the will of the spirit. Then you have verses like Philippians, where it tells us that uh, it is God who uh, helps us, uh, who energizes us to will and to do. Now, if it's God who energizes us to will, then we are no more responsible for our choices. Have you looked at that? But we have three will, the will of the body, the will of the soul, the will of the spirit. God energizes the will of your spirit, not your soul. Your soul still has the free choice to yield to the will, what your, what your spirit man wants to do. Your spirit man has a will, it wants to do something. It wants to pray. Uh, if I were to ask you right now, how many of you know that you should read your Bible more? How many of you know that you should pray more? How many of you know that you should worship? You know, now who is that who tells you that you should? The spirit within you which wants to do it. The one and the desire is the will of the spirit. So your spirit has a will. And the will of the spirit uh, uh, is actually this word here, the word communion. Communion, and we, we talk about Watchman Nee and how he wrote his book. Being Chinese speaking, he wrote the book in Chinese. And then it got translated into English. Something might have been lost in translation. Something might be lost in translation. As we discover, uh, I'm not going to try the Chinese word again. But uh, the, the Chinese word for one of those things that uh, uh, it, it means something else uh, than what the English translation brought forth. Something was lost in translation. So communion actually, what it actually is communion? Communion is like uh, uh, intimacy with God. And if we strictly take the word communion from the Bible, which is the word koinonia, translated communion or fellowship, it means to fellowship with God. And to fellowship with God involves two wills. You must choose God's wills, then you fellowship. Two free wills choosing to fellowship together, communion. So we have put communion and re rename it as will. And uh, then we say intuition. Intuition is like an inner knowing. So an inner knowing equals mind. Why not call it the mind? It will make it clearer. And we brought Ephesians chapter 4 where we show there is the spirit of your mind. And then we brought Romans chapter 8 which shows that uh, the spiritual man produces peace and life. The carnal man produces death. So there is a spiritual mind. and uh, So instead of calling it intuition, we call it mind. We rename it uh, to expand. And then, of course, there comes the conscience. And conscience is like our understanding. Is the Greek word is sunaidesis, which we're going to touch on tonight. Conscience, to many people, is like a sense of right and wrong. 
Isn't the sense of right and wrong some sort of emotional indicator inside you? It is. Because it's an emotional indicator, tonight you will see why the conscience can also be hardened. And it can be seared. That means uh, it cannot feel anymore. And so instead of calling it the conscience, we call it so now, uh, we call it the emotion. And so in my chart, I have to make sure that it's synchronized carefully. I can't put the communion here, I've got to rotate the chart, wheel and communion here. And uh, so now when you look at, look at my chart, remember inside my chart is hidden Watchman's chart. I just renamed the whole thing well, to expand on the teaching uh, from the Bible. And the main purpose of this teaching is to teach us about how our spirit, soul and body how all parts of us function as one man in God. So then we look at the new chart. Thank you. Uh, so this is the new chart that we're basing it on. And uh, the last Thursday teaching that we have done, we touch on the heart. We spend a whole session talking about the heart. We define the heart and uh, all its various meanings and uh, how uh, the various uh, concepts of the heart. So we went through that. Now, all those will be developed in the writings too. And uh, so now we see that it's a uh, synchronized. Eh? There's a body emotion, soul emotion, spirit emotion, body, soul, and spirit will, uh, body, soul, and spirit mind. And uh, we talk about the heart. By now, you all should clearly know where your heart is. When I ask you, where is your heart? What does the Bible call the heart? And uh, your heart includes both your spirit and your soul. Watchman Nee defines a heart as just uh, your conscience plus one third of your spirit, which is your conscience, plus your soul. And I showed that the heart included other things too uh, in, in this series. And we have completed that. Today we're going to look at uh, the conscience, which is like this part of us here. The spirit emotion. We have started to zoom in on, on all these things. We have touched about the general thing about two, three weeks. Then we have talked about the heart. And uh, now we're going to zoom in into this area called the spirit emotion, the heart, the, which Watchman calls the conscience. And uh, let's look at the word conscience and study very carefully. And in this study, you will see why I put the Conscience as spirit emotion. And, uh, let's look at uh, one part here. A scripture that is very hard to understand based on Watchman's chart. If you look at his old chart, this verse is very hard to feed. Remember, we restudy Watchman and we build upon it. As, as I mentioned, that uh, in our early days of calling the ministry, uh, I saw a vision of the uh, a building between two valleys which represent the church whose pillars are completed and that pillar represent the uh, prayers, uh, pillars of prayer and the two mountains I saw represent the first and the second coming of Jesus and then I saw about halfway up or third of the way up or so uh, to near the halfway point a group of people who were waving to me. I was still a third year Baptist seminary student doing my field work in Ganga Police, Malaysia. So uh, I had a three-day fast without food and water. My first actually, my first three-day fast without food and water. And in that fast, God graced me with that vision. And uh, so I saw uh, on the platform, halfway there, standing on one of the pillars, uh, Watchman, John Soong, from the books that I read, I recognized them, the spirit, and many others standing. A lot of these Asian ministers, and some also, I think I saw Hassan Taylor, some of all these other people there, and they were waving to me. And over the years, I've understood what it meant that uh, I was called to complete the ministry of John Soong, Watchman, and all those people in Asia uh, to bring it forth. Most of these people are very good teachers. They brought you to the place, but they stopped before the Pentecostal revival. The teaching never moved on. And uh, since then, the Pentecostal revival has come and gone. And we need to include some of these teachings and then complete that. I had a few encounters in my early days uh, in the spirit dimension with uh, 
uh, some dreams and watch many was marking my things and all that. Those are early days of my training. And, uh, so over the years, uh, uh, have to, we have to learn. See, everything that we learn, we always learn from those who come before us. We cannot take credit. No man is an island and no, no human being discover all things by themselves. You, in order to move forward, you must learn from all the best before you. And that was what I did. It, when I was in a Baptist seminary for three years, uh, I, one of my jobs was a librarian. And it's one of the biggest libraries in Southeast Asia. Just to let you know, I read nearly half of those libraries. So uh, I was uh, like a sponge. And uh, almost every man and woman of God that you know in church history or you heard about that is well known enough, I read their books, absorb them. So learn from them. There are a lot of things you got to learn. And then you're going to master what they know, then you can move on. How can God give you more if God really has given you so much that you never took it? And it's after absorbing all those things, I realized we still a lot of things missing. I began to seek God for more and more understanding. And uh, that's where uh, God continues to take you further. And so uh, that's where uh, we continue to build upon that and build this teaching on that will last in the next uh, four, four to five decades of this revival where many young ones are coming up, they will come straight into this teaching and then they won't have to deal with all those things of bones or inaccuracy that we had to deal with in our time. Thus, they can progress faster in this revival, move on into the things of God, and move into the close walk with Jesus. So we look at the word uh, spirit emotion, which Washmanly defined to be conscience, which in a Greek word is the word sunai desis. Romanized as S-U-N-E-I-D-E-S-I-S, sunai desis. And here's a word that does not fit in the, into uh, Washmanis uh, chart because he put the conscience as spirit correct and uh, that is where he links it in now turn with me to um, Hebrews chapter 10 Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 while you're turning there uh, yesterday's meeting was very good the Lord was pleased with it and that's why the Lord says that next month, uh, it was preparatory service yesterday, very good prayer, and uh, a lot of things the Lord has done. But next month, we'll begin our first of our miracle service. And because we are really going to receive miracles and a breakthrough, so by the next month, the last week of July, which is where our first miracle service will be on a Wednesday, uh, that whole week is what I call the week where I tell I did. It's the week where I see you for seven days. In other words, I see you on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Saturday because Friday goes to Saturday. And uh, so uh, we will still have a three-day fast. And during the three-day fast, which we didn't do this week, uh, we will gather for prayer. On Monday night, seven to nine. Tuesday night, seven to nine. And then a miracle service uh, on Wednesday. And uh, we, I'm also starting the fast earlier. Make it seven day fast from the Thursday before. Because the miracles that are coming are astounding. And we don't want to take it for granted. Just because God says we're going to do those things, let's respect God a little bit and say, God, you know, who are we to receive all these things? And we never ask for these things to come so early. We are, we'll be happy to build a revival slowly. Let it come in 2020 onwards. But God has expedited those things because He's shown us in vision how things are moving so fast that we have to go to the U.S. to plant a church. And in six years, we must reach to all of U.S. before 2027, when, when the war will start. And in fact, from 2022 onwards, there will be a breakout of civil war. And so because of all these things the Lord has revealed, we are running with the vision. And so God wants to speed up everything in Singapore, everything in Sydney, everything everywhere else will be planned. And even some of those of among the 12 leaders of the second generation, they got their assignment. And uh, Kenneth, who was here yesterday, flew in just specially for yesterday. Uh, he has his assignment to build altars all over China. He rewrote to me all this and said, good, those are exactly what the Lord does. 
So when we finish, they have only just begun. And uh, same with Arion, he will be given details of where to build the altars in all the 50 states of United, uh, in the United States. So here, let's look at the word, uh, you have found the words by now. Now, here's the interesting words. It says, let us draw near with a true heart, as if there can be a false heart. See, everything seems you can see the opposite, or potentially. A true heart. In full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience. I heard of the seared conscience. I heard of the weak conscience. But here, an evil conscience. And if you're a Greek scholar, the word evil comes from the word poneros, which is P-O-N-E-R-O-S, uh, which is the word for real evil. They have another word for bad things, which is the word kakos. And uh, that is just translated bad, but sometimes evil. But this one is the evil, evil word. And so it would be like some a word that you associate with Satan and the devil. It's almost like saying you have a satanic Conscience. Ah, satanic conscience. What kind of conscience is that? What kind of evil? To call it Pony Ross in the Greek is to call it satanic because only the devil is Pony Ross. So, how can the conscience reach this stage? Because the conscience is a consciousness of your emotions. Emotions can be good, can be bad, can be very, 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 very good, can be very, 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 very bad. And when your emotions eat into your spirit, it pollutes it. That is why I drew the chart to show how. And remember in the early study I said, originally when God made man, can we do the uh, up and down of this one? When God made man, we were not like that. We became, we were like that. We had only one mind. We don't have uh, an unrenewed mind. We have only one mind that governs our spirit, soul, and body. We have only one set of emotions that govern our spirit, soul, and body. It is perfection, and we will return to that. We have only one will that governs our spirit, soul, and body. But something happened during the fall. During the fall of man, these parts were chopped up. The spirit got disconnected to the soul. The soul got disconnected to the body. And so the, the light of God, which I represent here, Christ across, cannot flow through anymore. And being disconnected, it functions on its own. It is just like you got a devil on your inside. Now, the devil was once upon a time an angel. In fact, he was a cherub. The Bible calls him a cherub. And he was the cherub, the desire, tried to be like God. He was created by God. His life came from God. God can easily take the life back. Now he has life which comes from God and is rebelling against God. He has cut himself out from God and he still exists in rebellion against God with all the fallen angels. So it's like the universe in this core. The whole universe has been divided into three sections. The pristine side which Satan could not make to fall. Then the warring side and then the boundary section. And so you have even the universe cut into three sections. The boundary section is in between where the fall was. We are in the fallen section of the universe called the warring section. So even God's creation is cut into existing separately in three sections. And our spirit man has been chopped into three sections. And that's why we exist. And let's look again at the 
other chart, uh, the new new man. Yeah. Let's pull it up. Yes. So that's how we all got separated. Now we are on the road back. We are on the road back to the fullness of one heart, one mind, one emotion with our Lord Jesus Christ. And we are learning to become that glorious church. And which is why we learn to tune our emotions in the one, our will in the one, our spirit mind to be the spirit mind. That's where we are heading. We have a goal now. We know where we are heading. And having chopped us on this side, considering just this sector here, the emotions, that within each one of us, that's why the struggle in the Christian life is so real. You struggle not with two parts of yourself, three parts. We are tripartite in nature. First Thessalonians 5.23 tells us that we are spirit, soul and body. Tripartite. And each can exist on its own. Uh, angels primarily have spirit and soul. Angels can appear in bodily form, but their bodily form is like a spiritual material. Different from our glorified material form. Animals have body and soul. Animals don't have spirit. That is why you don't find animals building altars. If you haven't seen a wild dog or some dingo somewhere in the outback of Australia and you look, oh, an altar built by a dog in the shape of a dog. No such thing. They don't have spirit. Not, nothing inside wants to worship. Although they do acknowledge harmony with God. There's a soul. Animals have soul. They have feelings. They think. So animal kingdom exists there. We humans exist in between all. We interact both with angels and we interact with the physical dimension. We have a real physical body. And like the animals, whether they are male and female, we have gender. Angels don't have. Angels might look masculine, feminine, they don't have gender. Humans do. So because of that, when humans fall, it was a big fall, and there is that disharmony in three sections. And what we see of the evil conscience is actually the emotions turned upside down. That there is a spiritual part of the emotion that can become evil. There is a soul part of the emotion that is just in the soul. No demons are involved. Then there is a physical part of the emotion that can affect us. We can be affected by all three different sectors. Do you know that if we were to put you in a restricted habitation and control your diet, we can actually influence your emotion through, through, through diet. That's why what you eat also affects your emotional well-being. You might not realize that. But at the same time, the spiritual realm tries to influence our spiritual well-being or the devil tries to put the wrong thing. And then we have our own soul reaction, which is a whole, whole emotion of its own. So this conflict is there. But let me take one step at a time to build the whole scenario so that you know the picture we paint is scriptural. I point out to you that there is a Bible definition of an evil or poniros conscience. Firstly, we accept the fact that the word conscience, which is Sunai Desis, has been translated into other English words besides conscience. And uh, one of the most common English words is in the book of um, Let's look over here in the book of um, in Paul's writing here in uh, Sunai Desis. In um, let's look at First uh, Corinthians chapter eight, verse seven. 
It says, however, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol, talking about idol worship, until now it is as a thing offered to an idol. And their conscience, and this one, being weak, see I told you there is weak conscience, is defiled. In one sentence in the Bible, the same Greek word was translated into two different English words. If you had read it in the Greek, you wouldn't have seen the difference. The word, the first translation is the word consciousness. The word consciousness is the exact same Greek word for conscience, the word sunides. So let me put the Greek word inside and read it so you know it's talking about the same thing. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge for some with sunidesis of the idol. Until now, it is as a thing offered to an idol, and their sunidesis being weak is defiled. Okay, I've given you a Bible verse. Can you find another way to translate that first word, conscience? Can you see how the early translators try to con translate the English very difficult? You know how like some of you speak more than one language. You know how difficult it is sometimes to translate from the Chinese to the English. Because in Chinese you might have three, four different nuances of meaning. And you can have to choose one. Because you only allow one word. This is not the amplified version where you try to put everything. Already people complaining the Bible very long, put amplified very big. And then put all the nuances in, some are 10, then the Bible 66 books look like times 3. And before they start reading, they already fainted. <laughs> so you get the people who read the Bible. They are trying to get the Bible, you know, uh, simpler and simpler. Here you increase the expansion. And the same way, sometimes you do an English word, it's hard to translate into the Chinese because of the concepts. They are there. They're going to find a word for that. I wonder how, what is the Chinese word for photosynthesis? <laughs> By the way, so you good Chinese. What's the Chinese word for photosynthesis? Okay. A lot of people are afraid to... i got to get a good translator next time when we go to China or other places. They're afraid to translate my preaching because I use scientific words. <laughs> so how are we teaching a talk about atomic physics and E equal to NC squared and they got stuck. Uh, photosynthesis? Chinese word? Quanta. Wow, you got it. Eh? And you got the internet there or something? Yeah. <laughs> I thought smart I like really was smart. <laughs> he had a hidden you know, Wi-Fi somewhere inside him. Next time he had one billion with his teeth that talked to him. He always knowledge there. Put him on all the TV quiz, he'll win. Put him on the, what you call, you know, the, the, the million dollar, one million dollars in ten questions, you get all the right answers because you got internal internet. Anyway, <laughs> so you have um, what what quang quang what quang. Okay, now the Chinese word quang. What does it mean? Light. 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 Not bad. Next word. Her. What is her? Uh, Joy. Light combined. Light combined function. They did a good translation. Cool. Because photo is light. Synthesis is trying to combine something together. Hey, not bad. Uh, they, they did manage to get a concept over. Uh, the word synthesis in something combined together. Not bad. Not bad. I got to think of another scientific word. Okay. I'm sure they don't have one for tiny trotolian. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, uh, anyway, then you have uh, Sunai Desis. Now look at it in uh, verse uh, 22. Uh, no, 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 we are we're actually in Corinthians. Yeah, we're in Corinthians. Look at that verse there and see how difficult it is to translate that one into English. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge for some with Sunai Desis of the idol. So, what do you mean, Sunai Desis of the idol? 
If you put that conscience of the idol, hmm, idol got conscience. Idol don't have conscience. Idol is a dead thing. There was no way they could translate the Greek concept. And I bring before you here that the Greek concept of Sunai Basis involves some sort of consciousness. Not just a sense of right and wrong, which is the English definition for conscience. Some part of you that, that is like the, the little angel or the little devil, you know, they don't in cartoon, that one sit on the right and left and tell you, one whisper good thing, one speaker bad thing, yeah, uh, uh, then you choose, and you either become a saint or a devil, angel or devil, kind of thing. So that was like your little conscience talking to you, the English definition. But in the Greek, the definition of such a conscience is not that. It's a wider conscience. It's like some sort of sense of consciousness. So the only translating they could have is consciousness of the idol. Now here's another verse I throw out for you. And uh, this one is found back in Hebrews. Chapter 10, verse 2. Look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2. And in Hebrews 10, verse 2, it says, For then would they not have ceased to be offered? For the worshippers once purified would have had no more conscience or consciousness of sin. But the Greek word actually says, Sunai basis of sin. Sin where God is conscience. You never apply the word conscience to an inanimate concept or idol or object, correct? Only humans have conscience. Only humans. Okay, let me push it further. Do you think your dog has conscience? Yeah, in this song, you're going to say yes. Because you, you love your dog. You train your dog. And you say, wrong, wrong, wrong. So your dog. But you're, you're toilet training your dog. So, and your dog does it again. And they say, bad, bad. Now, your definition of bad and, bad and good is based on human. Because to the dog, everywhere is like outdoor. In fact, if you have a pet dog, you have to train them. Let me tell you, nature takes its course. The dog will smell for ground when they want to do their business. Just make sure when the dog is growing up, they know how to access the outdoor. Of course, here your outdoor is could be down there. So you might be living about 30 stories high. So your dog go outdoor is the last outdoor excursion they have. <laughs> <laughs> so... It's harder to train, I understand. But you got to make the place where you want them to do their business as outdoor as possible. As natural. Maybe put grass, maybe put sand or whatever. Then they smell it and they and it's a nature of the dog to look for those places. It is not their normal nature to do their business on cement or on your nice polished marble. Or the parquet floor. They don't like it actually. Because in the first place, they cannot dig. <laughs> you don't have to train them. Nature makes them want to go up. And so, does a dog have conscience? Well, by now you should be able to answer that question. If you cannot, we've got to go back to square one. <laughs> That it's easier to answer this way. Does a dog have a spirit? No. Okay. Then you go to the next one. Take spiritual man book two. Let your dog read it. And say, and say according to watchman me, or read it to your dog. And say, according to watchman me, conscience is in your spirit. So then you say, dog, you don't have spirit, therefore you don't have conscience. So watchman me can answer for you. Yes. He's already gone home. And what's when you will say, dogs don't have conscience. But dogs do have a sense of right and wrong. 
Now you know what I'm trying to get at. The, the, the definition that your conscience is for sensing right and wrong is inadequate to describe the word conscience. Or soon I this. Because I can prove that even dogs can be trained to recognize some sort of right and wrong. Correct? Some sort of right and wrong. You know why? Because it has nothing to do with conscience. It has to do with emotions. And I can say, does your dog have emotion? This one you should be able to answer. Yes. Okay, anyone say no? You're probably not a pet lover. <laughs> or you haven't reacted with pets yet. Animals do have emotions. If they don't, why does the RSPCA exist for? to protect against cruelty to animals because they do feel pain. If they don't feel pain, then our organization, our RSPCA, is redundant. Have you seen an RSPCA for trees? <laughs> None. Except that you got people trying to protect the environment. That's a different thing. But no one has been jailed for cruelty to plants. Because animals has a higher level than plants to feel emotion. So what you think that the dog has, which the dog doesn't have, was spiritual emotion. But doesn't the soul emotion look like the conscience? I put it this way. I could take the same dog and teach him that doing the business in a house is right and doing business outside is wrong. You could. Every time he does it outside, you beat him. He does it inside, you reward him. After one year, he will love the inside more than the outside. Why do you think it's natural for dogs to walk like that? <laughs> it's unnatural! Then why do they do it? For reward. All animals are trained with food. The day after all the training got no more food is the day they might bite the owner or trainer. <laughs> They're all trained based on reward and food. You could retrain a dog or you get a dog young. You could train him on the emotional basis of what is right and wrong. But what is right and wrong alone emotionally doesn't equal conscience. Where is the word Sunai Desis? It's a word that describes some sort of consciousness of the spiritual dimension. And that consciousness is not something in a thought form. It's something in a feeling form. A feeling is conscious. Having consciousness is to have a feeling. But that feeling or that sense of consciousness is your spirit emotion. So Sunai Desis of sins, it means the only way we could translate that was consciousness of sin. It's remarkable that they could not find another word. And I challenge you to find another word. Very hard to find. That's the best one single English word to try to include everything that Sunai Desis uh, speaks about. And we've given you uh, these alternate translations that are given here in your Bible. Well, that's Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 2. Now, Let's look at something that I call the opposite factor here. And um, the scripture, we are building on this understanding very slowly. Look at Acts chapter 23, verse 1. Acts 23, verse 1. In Acts 23, verse 1, 
is the very opposite of Hebrews 10 verse 22. Because here it says, Paul says, as he look up at the council where he was already in prison, or uh, he was on trial, he says to his council, the Sanhedrin council, and said, Men and brethren, I have lived in all good conscience. Good tonight, they say. Before God until this day. And when you look at Paul saying he lived in all good conscience, the word good is the stronger word for good than the normal word for good. The normal word for good is the word kalos, whose opposite is kakos, bad. But here is a stronger word for good that is more associated with God, which is the word agathos. Close to the word agape, the goodness of God. So the agathos conscience, or sunidesis, opposes in Hebrews 10.22 the poniros sunidesis. You got two opposite poles. The Agathos Sunidesis is like Paul saying, I believe as true to my emotions spiritually as I know best. Now, when Paul says, I have lived past tense in all good conscience before God until this day. I have one question. What about during the time when he was persecuting the church? What about when he was bringing them to prison? He got letters on this. The same council gave him letters to imprisonment, to imprison and put Christians to death. Same council. Might be different men by that time, over many years. Was Paul walking in his conscience? Was he walking in Poniros conscience or Agathos conscience? Outwardly, he was doing a bad thing. He was, he himself admitted, he didn't justify it. He admitted, it was wrong. It was wrong. What he did was wrong, putting Christians in prison, killing them, sanctioning the killing. He was the one holding the clothes of those who stole Stephen. Paul called himself the chief of sinners. He admitted, I am a chief of sinners because unlike all the others, I have persecuted the church. I have been a blasphemer against God. Now, in Acts 23, verse 1, when Paul says, I live in all good conscience, do you think Paul included a period of his life? Yes. It's a yes or no question. Yes. He did. He included all that part when he was outwardly an evil man. Yes. He did. <laughs> if, he, if he was, if, if he said his conscience was so good, so good. Now that sounds like advertising on some tea or coffee or whatever. So good. But it's more advertising of our God who says, God is so good. And actually we have we have a we have a tune for that in Greek. He said, God is so good, God is so good, God is so good to me. Hotios estinagatos. Hotios estinagatos agatos. Otios estin agatos, agatos, otios estin agatos. So we actually put the Greek part in the song. So we never get to sing it. So, because we sing it how way, people say, what kind of church is this? Is it Latin? No, it's Greek. <laughs> so, anyway, Paul outwardly killing people, outwardly imprisoning people, inside him, otios estin agatos. <laughs> Oh, Dios is the Nagata. So you all agree, right? He, he, he included that part of his life. When outwardly he was an evil person, doing all the bad things. But Jesus even rebuked him, saying, You know, uh, uh, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Right? He, he was 
He, 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 in, inside him was all good. Outward was all bad. <laughs> all agree? Uh, how can that be? Because he really fought the Lord. He really fought the Lord. So, where you go? All of you agree, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, we got hundred percent agreement. Hey, wait, you got no dissenting. Okay, so you got something else. Hmm. But then he used the word conscience. Cannot run away. So nine days is. We have to put Sunai Desis based on Book 1, Watchman Nee. Only in the spirit. Re remember, we, I took you from the place where you agree that dogs have no, no Sunai Desis. <laughs> and Paul is not a dog, right? <laughs> he has Sunai Desis. He said, his Sunai Desis was good. Good. As good as the soya bean drinks that are really good out there. Good. You know what I'm getting at? The Sunai basis is not a basis of right and wrong. Paul was right inside, but he was wrong outside. Can you see that? When I apply it to dogs, it looks ridiculous. Now I apply it to a, a man who became one of the foremost apostles and the main author of most of the New Testament doctrine and theology. Paul himself. And you are right in that sense. Paul did say he thought he was serving God. See, in in his encounter, and uh, in chapter 26, as he talked about his life, of Acts, um, yeah, past 26, Acts 26, yep, there we are. In Acts 26, Paul again was testifying before him and then he talks about how in uh, verse 12 to verse 7, 18 he go into greater detail about God meeting him, Jesus. But look at his words in verse 9. I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. So he says, I thought I should have eliminated them because I thought they were the bad guys. That was his testimony. He says, I thought they were the bad guys. And uh, he was trying to, trying to do good because he was good inside. He was trying to do good. He thought that the Christians are pests. The Christians are the cops, the Christian are the bad guys. And so he was getting rid of the bad guys based on his understanding of the Jewish law. As you know, in, at that time he was not in the New Testament yet, although he was in the New Testament. He was based on Old Testament law. And the law says you can kill bad guys. <laughs> They've done it in the Old Testament, and so he's redoing it in, a, in what he thinks was still the Old Testament law period. After all, for him, Christ has not come. So it was justifiable to kill the bad guy based on Old Testament law. And that was his understanding of it. And look at his testimony one chapter before, chapter 22 of Acts. When he was before the crowds. And he said in verse one onwards. Brethren, fathers, lend me your ears. No, he did not say that. That was another. 
Brothers, brethren, fathers, hear my defense before you now. And when they heard that he spoke to them in the Hebrew language, they kept all the more silent. And he was in public. He said, I'm indeed, in verse 3, a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, taught according to the strictness of our father's law, was zealous, and this is part, was zealous toward God. I thought, Paul says, that I was serving God. So, you are right. He was good on the inside. But his inside good did not convert into outside good. And that is why we are learning what the New Testament is. You know what New Testament is? Inside good, outside must also be good. But another thing we learn about the conscience, it is not reliable. Tell me what better conscience you can improve on than to have agathos, sunidesis. Can you improve on that? You can't. It is using the best Greek word possible for the word good, agathos, as opposed to the word podiros. You can't improve on an agathos conscience. Yet, it was not enough. Can you see that? It was not enough. Not in the New Testament. One third of your spirit is not enough. Because just as you cannot rely on your emotions to make all your decisions, you cannot rely on one third. I feel good. Oh yeah. <laughs> or you might be even convinced that it is right and good. Doctrinally. As Paul was trained, it's still wrong. See, good and bad cannot just be based on subjective. You know the meaning between subjective and objective. The word subjective means from your inside. Objective means from the outside. So an objective view is a view outside of you. Subjective view is what you feel on your inside. Good and bad cannot just rest on our feelings of good and bad. Which is where society is now heading towards. Society is heading towards the point where if the majority feel that something is good or right, then it makes it good and right for the whole country. We might be heading the wrong direction. Because long, long, long ago, in a time of kingdoms and kings, in a time where there are no human rights, where humans are in classes. You're either born a slave or you're born in a free man. Or you're either born a royalty or you're born a peasant. peasant. And you can't change that. Long, long ago during those times. There were a lot of wrong things done that the whole country and community thought were right. Example, slavery. Another example, we still sometimes practice by ancient uh, areas of long Asian societies, that when, some, uh, when a family does wrong, the emperor will kill the whole family for three generations. The whole family must be, even the innocent babies, must be killed, eliminated. To them, that was the law. But the law was wrong. Society is heading back towards that. Then you ask, what is the basis of right and wrong? The Bible. Something outside us. Whether you agree or disagree with the Bible, you cannot change the Bible. God says, Thou shalt not... 
how to change that. It came from outside. Something external. And there's something about us humans that are self-limiting. Do you know we cannot walk in a straight line? I know that you all walk in a straight line coming here. You walk in a straight line coming here because you can see the things around you. If we take you and put you on the desert without a compass, take you and leave you in Antarctica or Arctic Circle where everything looks the same, or in the Amazon jungle, where everything looks the same, and you've got no landmarks to tell north, south, east, west, and you don't have enough knowledge to tell by the sun or the stars, and you don't rely on external things. Relying on the sun, the compass, the stars is external. But you rely on your own sense of walking, I'm walking in a straight line, walking in a straight line, walking in a straight line. You will actually be walking in a big circle. At the end of the day, after a month of walking, you say, hey, footprints, oh, I'm safe. And you check your own footprints. <laughs> Because we all humans tend to put one, one foot stronger than the other. Thus, we always lean either the left or the right slightly. And when you lean on one side slightly, you're already on a circular path. We need something outside of us to tell us the direction. And the combination of the two helps. Because if we, anyone you try using the compass, some compass keep moving all the time. And then you say, yeah, this north, but then for the, oh, that's north, but the north, your north and my north is about 100 meters apart. Slightly same direction, because north is so big. And you might be heading on the wrong path. Like when we went up to auto building in Bindiri 2, that's a long, 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 long walk. And and we, we play safe for everyone. We tie ribbons along the route. We make sure we compass. Make sure different different groups have compass. I know some of them had the compass, but the compass was not really working. You shake it a bit and not change a bit. <laughs> and so some of them you compass. Hey, that direction. That. But they need to remember where they came from, the rocks, the trees, and the compass. So generally, the compass will tell you I'm still going the right direction. But compass alone. It's so general. You walk slightly 100 meters off where there's a big uh, di uh, ditch or whatever, and the swamp will say, oh, that's true now. Yeah, true now. Then you come to a place where, wow, no way now. Whereas there might be another path just slightly 50 meters off, and it's still you know, pointing to the north to a certain extent, and you need to be able to climb that path. You need to rely on landmarks, Familiar places that you know the direction you're having, have going, plus the external, plus of course your internal thing that you sense. All this helps you walk in a straight line. So the moral sense of right and wrong, you give it to conscience. Over this half an hour, I've completely destroyed your reliance on the conscience. <laughs> Now you all might go out conscienceless. <laughs> so I cannot let you out. Doors are locked until you finish the teaching. <laughs> I'm not saying that the conscience cannot be used. Now if the conscience is so unreliable. Now Paul, do you know why Jesus reached out to him? If you see Paul in the spirit, outwardly he was an evil man. But you really saw his heart. He really thought he was serving God. He himself said in his testimony in, in Timothy, he says, God had mercy on me because God knew I was zealous towards him. That was why Jesus reached out to him. So conscience is still important. Conscience is still important. The words I started with in Hebrews 10.20, it tells us conscience is important. Your conscience is like your internal confirmation but not the only one. You cannot build your life around your conscience. Although your conscience will bring you to the place where God will have mercy on you. Remember Romans 2 category, where 
even the Gentiles without the law walk according to the law. They are conscience excusing or accusing them. Let's look at it. Romans 2 category. Romans chapter 2. Those without Christ. So the conscience is still plays a role. But I want to reduce the role to the conscience to one third of this child. To show that it cannot be relied. Which is why it again emphasizes why the definition of the heart in the spiritual man book 1 was not accurate enough. Because the heart was only the conscience but the soul. The heart has to include the other parts of your spirit. And so let's look at Hebrews chapter 10 verse 22 again. We see he tells us to have a true heart. To have a true heart, you need your emotions cleansed, spirit, soul, and body. So he said, having our heart sprinkled from an evil conscience. So we do need to get rid of the evil conscience. Now, if Paul's, Paul's heart has a good conscience, agathos sunidesis, and he does evil things, outwardly, you might have a man who has a poniros conscience, but does good things, but all the while is evil. An example of that, the Antichrist who is coming. An example of that, the devil. When the devil told Jesus, and show him all the kingdoms of the world and says, All these I will give to you if you will bow down and worship. He is an evil man, <clears throat> the devil. Rather, he is an evil being. One day he will manifest through the fallen angel, becomes an antichrist born of human flesh, to be evil. Evil in the court, pure darkness. Bowerly, a man of peace. Living harmony, <coughs> harmony, harmony, harmony. Inside pure Pony Ross. Outwardly doing good. Now he seems to be favoring Jesus. He seems to be helping Jesus. But there was a See, when you say evil, like evil, that is what Pony Ross is like. Really evil. He was wanting to get Jesus under his thumb. To propagate evil. Do you think, okay, let's look at another one. With, oh, that actually that would be almost like semi-animal thing, but really bad. When the serpent said to Eve and Adam, do you want to be like God? And that was evil! It looks like he was helping. He looks like he wants to help them. But he actually wants to destroy. Can you see the contrast now? Agatha's conscience outward perceived bad. Pony's conscience outward can perceive good. Yet, yet, don't panic. Don't throw away your conscience. Don't become conscience less. God looks into your conscience. That's an amazing thing. God does look into your intentions. Although intentions alone will not save you, yet it is an important factor. Correct. Motivation is important. The same, like there are many pastors and ministers to, in the world today. There are five, four ministers. There are many apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. 
but what is the motivation? If a fivefold ministry only does fivefold ministry work for the sake of money, his motivation is different. His whole ministry will come out different. If the fivefold ministry does the ministry for the love of God and the love of people, it will come out different. So don't underestimate the agathos conscience. Even though its manifestation might not be perfect. Because God looks at the conscience. In the long run, better have a very good conscience and purify yourself from an evil conscience. So Romans 2, which you should have by now, God looks at a conscience even among those who are not saved yet and He considers that when their conscience is good, like in verse 15, who show the word, they don't have the law, they don't have the Jewish law, but in their life, they walk according to their conscience. They show the work written in their hearts. Their conscience, see the conscience is in the heart. Their conscience also bearing witness between themselves. Their thoughts accusing or else excusing them. It's either or based on their conscience. So the conscience is important and you all know the, uh, the other, other verses that we look at. That to live according to your conscience is more important than to live according to church law or traditional law or religious law. I didn't say, your Bible say, yay! Romans Chapter 14 and 1 Corinthians. Let's look at that. Romans 14. You see, they were having a problem with religious law and religious people. Because some say that you should eat only vegetables. Some say it's okay to eat meat. So this is a religious problem. And it's a problem that comes from culture and a problem that came from their religious background. It is, it is coming to the church. This was now a church problem. And Paul has to make a judgment. He says in verse 2, One believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. Let him who does not eat judge him who eats. For God receives him. He said, he said, God is okay with that. So one guy wants to be a vegan, vegetarian all their lives because they're convinced. Cannot eat animal, cruelty to the animal. Have you seen how animals die? Have you seen how they're slaughtered? Ah! <laughs> so after seeing a few bar, you lost your appetite for eating. All you have to do, watch how the chickens are killed. <laughs> I don't know why I lose the appetite for chicken. <laughs> Although some people are so hardened, even when they are being killed, you see how delicious they are. <laughs> That's called a hardened conscience to a chicken. <laughs> anyway. So in terms of eating vegetables or meat, he, sa he says, as long as their conscience tells them, they must flow with their conscience. Then he talks about to obey the Sabbath law, a Sabbath day, or observe it, or don't observe the Sabbath day. See, some people still do. See, this came from their Jewish background, where the Sabbath was like irrevocable. It was like a major sin in the area. Just like today, if you came from a Catholic background, the communion you take is very holy. And you don't dare to buy it. Because if you bite too loud, you could, you could literally hear, based on your weak conscience, the scream of Christ. So that's why they designed the communion to melt. And Christ melts into you. Rather than you bite, um, 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 um. <laughs> and each, each, each month, Christ says, Ow, 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 right? you're eating the body of Christ. It's all in your imagination. 
because of a person's background. So here's something that it is uh, it is wrong not to keep the Sabbath law. Some say that it is okay. And Paul says in verse 6, He who observes the day, observes it to the Lord. He who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord. He gives thanks. He who does not eat, for to the Lord he does not eat and give thanks. And in the end, Paul's uh, conclusion is that let each one walk in accordance to their level of faith without condemnation. See, it says here in verse um, 21, It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who does is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith. Whatever is not from faith is sin. So what is faith? Faith is your conviction. But there are degrees of different conviction. How do I know a person's level of faith? by how well trained your conscience is to the Word of God. The more well trained your conscience will stop being an evil conscience. Let us start from square one. We all have our conscience polluted. Our conscience is not functioning 100%. Otherwise, we would not have sin. And because our conscience is not 100% reliable, it's trained in the wrong things and all the same. Because basically, your Sunai Day says your conscience is just your emotion. Emotions can be trained. In psychology, they call it conditional reflex. Even dogs can be trained. Humans can be trained. And here's the thing. A lot of us, in psychology, they say they like to go to psychology before coming to the Bible. In psychology, they, they, got, they call it, there is an absolute reflex and conditional reflex. Conditional reflex are what you have been associated with because you're conditioned to feel good in something. Like the dog, remember Palo's dog, every time he ring the bell, ding, then he feed the food. Ding, then he feed the food. Ding, then he feed the food. Then the next time, just ding, the, the dog really survived. <laughs> Or sometimes he used the same bowl. So the dog keeps seeing the same bowl. So every time he, he touched the bowl and sees the bowl, the dog goes. So some of us laugh at the dog. Ha ha ha, ho ho ho, ha ha ha. And then we laugh at the dog. Without realizing you yourself have been conditioned. You know how? For example, let me give this uh, illustration from a psychological book. Psychology book. Uh, in talking about condition reflex and absolute reflex, uh, it talks about how, for example, uh, 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 two young people, uh, man and woman, a young man. So they go, what's the word that Eddie likes to use? Pacto! Why do call it? <laughs> okay, okay. So they go dating. So they go to this seaside place where the wind is gentle, the sea breeze, and the waves are gentle, coconut leaves waving, and in this atmosphere they spend a lot of time together, and so it has built a good feeling, and every time, you know, one of them goes to the place to remember the good times they have had. Then, over the years, they separate. They didn't make it. And uh, they, they, they went apart. So the girl one day meets another young man. And then they happen to go near the place. And she doesn't actually like this young man. Everything tells her, nah, this is not the one for you. But one day they happen to be in a beach sea where the waves were rolling, the wind was a light breeze, 
the coconut leaves are swaying. At that very moment, she felt so in love with this man, whom she just hated two days ago. <laughs> and whatever the young man tells her she will do, she wants to do, she yields. And they went, you know, further and further. Then, that night she go back. All her feelings of feeling that this person is wrong for her come back. Then she said, why am I so stupid? Why did I go, you know, halfway with him? You were Palos dog. You had conditioned yourself to feel good in certain environment. Without knowing it, it subconsciously sits into you. And from the psychological viewpoint, this is what they try to do. They try to remove all the conditional reflex that are false for you to find your true reality and the real you. Well, let's leave psychology for a moment. That's not what we're talking about. Come back to the Bible. In the Bible, since the Bible got soul, you need to understand some psychology to know that we build our own false reality. Why do some people have a persecution complex? Because they are convinced inside themselves that people are actually persecuting them. Whenever they see somebody whisper, they might be talking about the weather, the latest football game. But this person, every whisper is about me. Is it true? No. But you're convinced. Perhaps you have heard those situations. And you have conditioned yourself to believe it. You live in a false reality. Do you know how many humans live in false reality? A lot of them. You might encounter some coming in on the way to church. They might be in the church here right now. <laughs> We all have a measure of false reality that we have built. So fully convinced that we are right when we are wrong. Didn't Paul, now let's talk about the Bible, didn't Paul live in a false reality? When he was convinced he was right when he was wrong. Yeah, Agathos, so like this is a false reality. It must be removed. And inside each one of our lives, without realizing it, we have built false reality. False reality is like thinking the church you grew up in must be the only right church. I will live here. I was, I was brought here. I was uh, baptized here. I was uh, 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 helped here. You will help, so that immediately you have an emotional debt to the church. And uh, then you, 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 you will marry there, and you hope that you will have your funeral also there. <laughs> so that you're so blind to the fact that your church might not be teaching truth. It might be a church that is anti-charismatic. But your emotional attachment to the church is so great, you would rather die there than leave the church and grow spiritually. All of us have false realities built. It was never pointed out to us. And the false realities are based on our wrongly trained conscience. Because we tell ourselves this is right and this is wrong. It's wrong now to do this. It's right now to do this. It's wrong now. And we only rely, we only rely on our conscience. And put it this way, if your conscience is so great, why did Paul talk about a weak conscience and an evil conscience? I agree that the conscience is important. I'm not understanding. I don't want you to walk out of place and say, oh, don't need conscience, but throw it. <laughs> don't throw the 
baby out with a bathtub, bath water. The baby is still there. Your conscience is needed. Your conscience needs to be trained. It's a very important part of you. But tonight we know one thing. You cannot rely on your conscience alone. Can, what about the guy who says, I will only keep the Sabbath day. The other days are not equal to the Sabbath day. Okay, subjectively he thinks he's right. But what is the true picture? The true picture, Paul himself said, that is a weak heart. He calls it weak. Paul is really pulled no punches. He said, to him that is weak, he pulled no punches. He called that slightly wrong. And he said, to those of us who have this understanding, every day is the same. Because it's not given to the Lord. So the other guy's conscience is actually weaker. So who has a real, the real perspective and reality? The one in the New Testament who realized the Sabbath law, the law has been done away in Christ. It's the only commandment that has been removed because Christ is not the Sabbath. Now the Sabbath law is good too. It is good for your body. Your body needs one day to rest. It is good mentally because mentally you need every seven days you need something to refresh your mind. But spiritually as a law and a religious thing it's been done away. Now Paul talked about eating vegetables and meat, correct? Which we're not asking which is right and wrong now. Which is more right and more wrong? <laughs> more right is that you can eat on anything. Slightly weaker. He called it the weaker brother. He put them lower. But that's their level of their conscience. What about First Corinthians say about idols? He says that idol is nothing. But to those who have consciousness or I got one word to replace the word consciousness, but it's too long, so let me the word consciousness. This is the word I replace it. But the one who has an emotional affinity to the idol, see, his emotions is weak. Because he still feels the emotional power from the idol. It's all in the emotion. He calls that the weaker brother. Now Paul was very generous. He says, the strong can follow the weak. The weak cannot follow the strong, which is obvious. So he says, in the presence of the weak, we can come down to their level. No problem. No problem. And you know, I can easily convince you that in just eating vegetarians alone is wrong. You cannot establish it. You know why? Jesus ate lamb. Now, don't just go me eating, of course. Jesus ate fish. So Jesus eat both. He was okay with that. If it's okay for Jesus, it's okay for me. Of course, some meat eaters say, Hallelujah! Hey, don't shout so loud. I'm sick of the vegetarians. <laughs> yes? Did you clarify a few things? Yes. In the past, when I was first accepted Christ, I was told I'm not allowed to eat food that offered to idols. Uh. So therefore, when, therefore, I, I, I didn't eat. But if this scripture says that actually it's food offered to idols, you can eat, be subject to conscience, you eat. Yes, and you say eat whatever in the marketplace, eat asking no questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then, in 1 Corinthians 8, so for those of you online cannot hear the question, she is asking about the uh, in her early life, and most Asians face this. I face it. Because when I, I was the first one born again, and my mother worship idols. Because she's born again now. Same with my father. My whole family all born again. And so I did not eat for the sake of differentiation. And in, in our culture, because we all grew up, even in Singapore, modern society, you go to any modern shop sometime. Everything is pristine, aircon, high technology, everything, all top class, first class high technology. Right at the corner, at the back, is a little idol. 
and they have modernized it. Instead of lighting a candle, they got electric bulb. <laughs> also using technology. Next time they use LED also. <laughs> and the Bible's only reason is this. There are two reasons given the Bible not to eat idol food. One, if it's a participation with the ceremony, which is another verse where it says, don't, you know, uh, don't, don't, don't partake with uh, the worshippers of uh, idolatry. If it's a participation in idol worship, and eating is part of the participation. Number two, when it stumbles another brother, so the Bible gave us two reasons not to eat. And those are your only two reasons. In Asia, because there are more people with the Sunni basis of the idol. So more people are stumbled. For that reason, the law is tailored for Asians. There is a general rule, just avoid it if someone tells you. So, which is like what I call subjective application of that. Next. No worry, teaching, you can ask questions. I'm glad you asked. So they remember to ask. Now, when you're sharing the conscious, right? Actually, actually, are you referring to self-conscious? The conscience. The conscience, is it self-conscious? Is it? Yes. So it's conscience true. is actually self-conscious. That, that's your way of putting Singaporean English. Uh. So, you know, so you can call it self-conscious. Oh, okay. Uh. So therefore, we have not moved on to God. Yes. So you still accept self Correct. That's why we cannot just rely on the conscience. Alright, thank you. But it's important. Because consciousness is part of our developing. So last time, uh, let me try to tell some stories. Uh, last time when we had church in Malaysia, I, have, I had many elders and many pastors. I have about 50 pastors, elders and deacons. So one day, one of the elders' wife came. It started wearing a head covering. So I looked and said, okay, that's interesting. I thought it was just one, one Sunday. Next Sunday, she's still wearing. And the next, and the next, and the next. So I had a private woman and said, is this a fashion thing? Or is this a religious thing? Because some people, they read the part about a woman should have a head covered. And then you read in between the lines, it says long hair is your covering. But today's fashion, what, how do you define long, right? So what do you mean by long? One kilometer, two kilometers, right? <laughs> and, uh, so uh, because uh, uh, it's not definable. Then Paul says, there's a little clause there that says, and this is not practiced in the other churches. They, they forget the tiny little word. Inside you'll find, this is not a custom in the other churches. It was only a Corinthian problem. So you're not in Corinthians. An enemy Corinthians is gone. City all blasted, gone. It's an ancient place. Only two years ago. I mean, uh, it, the ruin part. I don't mean the, the, the modern city. Uh, so Paul says only that area. And so in the end I say, look, if you're fully convinced, this, she said, I feel that the Lord tells me to watch it. Use the Lord's name. And when anyone uses the Lord's name, I will give them a chance. If it doesn't contradict any other part of the Bible. So I say, since you feel this is the thing, I say, only two requirements I require of you. One, do it unto the Lord yourself. Two, don't spread it to all the other ladies. Because this is not our doctrine. Because the day I find, you know, you spread all the other women coming in, come in. Or what kind of church is this? And you know, that would be wrong already. So then after about a year or so she stopped marrying. So she went through a phase in the development of wanting to please God. And that's when we got to understand that conscience is important because it's the individual desire to grow to please God. And we humans are law-based creatures. We we want to please God with something we can feel and touch, something we can do. Something we can regulate. Something is a law based. We humans tend to do that. And a person might go through their growth in that way. Once they have grown through that, then they realize the spirit is the spirit of liberty. There is no Bible scripture in the whole New Testament that says that you should wear hair covering, even in the Old Testament, in fact. 
Not even in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the, even the Jewish women go to church without a covering. It's a man who got funny little head covering. Opposite. So it's a cultural thing. Paul says it's only a Corinthian problem. But you see how important the conscience is? You must not go against your conscience. Yes? Or the pig's blood and Ah, you come to pig's blood, eh? Okay? <laughs> Which includes all the blood of other things. Yeah. Okay. In the Bible, in the Old Testament, it was a religious law not to eat. In the New Testament, the closest you can find is in Acts 15. They tell you don't eat idols, uh, don't worship idols, and they say to avoid blood and all those things. And we will say of this, that because Christianity has spread over many cultures, we understood not just the law, but the principle behind the law that the reason for not eating blood is more a natural reason and no more a religious reason. Not in the New Testament. Because in the New Testament, whether you eat blood or you don't eat blood, it's still the blood of Christ that cleanses you. However, the eating of blood is definitely something like the eating of something like, would you eat uh, McDonald's every day of your life, 365 days, four times a day. You know the story called, what is that? The, the, the guy who ate Mac, McDonald's all his life for, he nearly died. Right? It's the same with eating blood. That blood carries sickness and diseases. As a first transmitter, the first point of infection of any animals. And so for that reason, take the religious law of the animals, clean and unclean animals, as hell laws, and then you'll be New Testament. There are no more religious law, they are hell laws. Laws are hell that God knew things we don't know, that we are discovering the scientific reasons why we should not eat blood. But then you cannot be strict in your application because if you're preaching to the Maasai, where it's so poor, their only source of iron and protein is mixing some blood or animal with their milk. You cannot just ask them to change straight away. You can't. Or if you're in a place where there's very little food. And all there is there is that. Okay, here's a, a question, a trick question I have for you. Not really a trick, but a thing. You remember the story of the plane that crashed inside America and they were stuck and no one discovered them. And they survived by eating each other. They, 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 not eating each other alive, I mean, they eat the, the meat of the people who died to survive. Here's the thing. If that happened to you, would you eat or not? Of course, some of you more clever ones say, it won't happen to me because I'm the perfect will of God and it's about God's will. Very clever, thank you very much. But I'm saying that should it so happen, and uh, in that situation, would you have eaten? How many of you say that you won't? You won't. You won't. How many of you say that you would? What? Then oh, you would. Okay. Some won't, but nobody say they would. Only one. The rest, don't you know? Wait till such a thing happen, then I decide. Well, clever. Okay. I am actually on the side of those who I can't. I know I won't die because I'll be translated. But in that hypothetical situation, I tell people, you know what I tell them? Should I die, please eat me. No condemnation. <laughs> but I myself find it hard to cross the barrier of eating another human meat to live. I'd rather say my prayers and die. <laughs> So I can understand those of you who do that. It's a difficult thing, correct? But the people who did it survive. Because there was no food there. So there is a worse scenario than eating blood. Um, in the end, thank God for the New Testament, we are free from all the laws, except the one in Acts 15, that uh, had nothing to do with idols, and uh, live a really moral life, and the law of God. But we conclude tonight, we have more things to touch on, but we conclude tonight to show how your emotions is only one part. 
Now, many sub point. What does an evil conscience do? An evil conscience always accuses you. That is why you must remove the accusation or the condemnation that is in your own heart. You must have the word cleanse. Only the word can go deep enough to renew and train your conscience. The only trainer for the conscience is the word. Because you might have been brought up all your life to believe something is right and wrong, which contradicts the word. But when you first hear about the word, it's hard to believe. But if you keep listening to the word, the word will retrain your conscience. So you need an external factor to right and wrong. And the external factor is the word. The word is your objective definition of right and wrong. And that word helps you tune. Now after you tune it and your conscience is tuned, your conscience is 100% reliable. But we must always realize, we all must still develop future false realities. We all might have inherited false realities that must be removed. What is truly real and what is not truly real? Are our, the things that we do condition reflex? Are we self-deceived? We must allow the word to cleanse us. So that we are honest to the Lord, honest to our conscience, honest to people, honest to God, and let the word speak into our lives. That is the part of the conscience that you can see through today's teaching. It is pure conscience or self-consciousness, like Wybin says. It is an emotion that needs to be trained. Here is a danger zone. Remember there are danger zones that Jesus says. That if you curse or say or get angry at your brother in the Sermon on the Mount, you have to watch. Because let not the sun go down on your anger, lest you give room to the devil. So this area, the emotion thing, for it to flow, we must watch it all, all the time. Because this is an entrance of the enemy to use a seared conscience, to use an evil conscience. To use a conscience that is based on a false condition reality against you. And that is why to say that you cannot rely on your conscience is wrong. To at the same time say that that's all you need to rely is also wrong. But we have put the conscience in its place. The conscience is important. Paul says that we should have faith we have a good conscience because the conscience tells us a level of faith. You cannot cheat yourself, you cannot be dishonest with yourself, you cannot lie to yourself. Your body will know that you lie. You yourself. In fact, they have been tested psychologically. We humans are made to love and to tell the truth. When you tell a lie, your whole body system goes against you. And remember at one time we did a scientific analysis of reverse speech. Reverse speech is when they tape it. It's not back masking. Back masking is something else. Reverse speech is when you speak something and they play it backwards. And uh, an Australian discovered that. They find that when you are trying to lie, your reverse speech tells the truth. You could not hide your lie. Some part of your body reacts. In fact, if you live a lie all your life, your lies are causing you sickness and death. Your life is killing you literally. Your false reality is killing you. The only cure is to get back to the truth. And there is only one truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And His Word is the way, the truth, and the life. However, your conscience, once fully trained, is an instrument so accurate and remarkable. It's the conscience, the way, the Lord. Once well trained, the, your, con, your conscience, which is actually your consciousness, 
will make music that affect your soul and your body. And heart will spring forth from you. You cannot have a merry heart unless your conscience is in tune. But a merry heart do a good like a medicine. And when the Holy Spirit fills you, one of the things it gives you is a song in your heart. Making melody in your heart. Making melody in your heart. So it makes melody, and that melody is what cures you. I'd like to end with this conclusion. That in the end, your conscience is actually not a base consciousness of right and wrong alone. It includes that. It's not even just an indicator of the level of faith. You know what? If you understand, and this is where it helps you, if you understand that your conscience is pure spirit emotion, then your conscience is actually the part of you that sings. See, in life, we need music. We need knowledge and wisdom. We need free choice. Right. Without free choice, some people would rather be die a free man than live a slave. Let's be human. We treasure freedom. We need freedom in order to experience life, the fullness of life. At least a sense of that freedom. We need wisdom and knowledge to have the sense of discovery. We need music. If you think what makes your life rich, what makes life enjoyable, Take away all the music in the whole planet. Imagine what the whole planet is like. <sighs> Correct? Whether you're someone who plays music a lot or hears music a lot, doesn't matter. Music is important to humans. It is important. It is a part of us. And the secret to training here, Ephesians chapter 5, the melody in your heart. And remember God created us to be like Him. He made us have this part that can worship. You cannot really worship without emotion. You need emotions to worship. You need emotions to enjoy Laughter, pleasure. This is the part of you that enjoys life. You take away emotions, you're just a robot. That is an important part of you. See, your conscience is more than that. It helps you enjoy life. And train it in the way of the Lord, and life becomes full. And the actual training of your conscience is in hearing the music from your heart. When your heart plays the music again, your conscience is healthy. When the music stops, then you've got to watch out. And if you watch every little child that grows up, they're all naturally musical. Even when they call their mama, Mama, when they play, come here. Now this be I got. I'm here. <laughs> Music has gone. <laughs> Music has gone. <laughs> we need to find that music again. When that music is alive and playing, life is rich. The Christian life is fun, which is why. People say, wow, oh, you fast so much. Yeah. We enjoy fasting. Ah. <laughs> you pray so much. We enjoy prayer. <laughs> See, it is not works. We actually do it because we enjoy it. We got so much benefits from it. If we don't enjoy it, we cannot last long. Yeah. And by the way, being in the ministry, I enjoy the ministry. It's when you enjoy it that you reach your peak. Think about it. If you don't, if you're an engineer, don't enjoy being an engineer. You can never reach your peak. You're already working against yourself. If you're an architect, you don't enjoy being an architect. You already work against yourself. 
If you're a Christian, you don't enjoy the Christian life, God help you. I don't know what you want to be. I don't know why many preachers and many churches take the fun out of Christian life. It's like they are so convinced that the 11th commandment is Thou shalt not have fun. I don't find in the Bible. God wants to make your life fun. Jesus never used the word fun. But he says, I have come that you might have joy and that your joy might be full. If Jesus was talking to some of these people who talk street language, Jesus would be telling them, I've come so your life will be fun. Put the fun back into your Christianity from the Word. Take pleasure in God and you will find your conscience strong and back to the place where it is. We talk about the other two-thirds of your spirit man. But this is how we develop our spirit man. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we pray as we come to understand the place of the spirit, the soul and the body. How much Lord we have misunderstood the part of our conscience. And some people think that just because their conscience can tell right and wrong and sense right and wrong that their, their conscience is well trained. When to us on a scale of 1 to 10, that's only level 3. Only when they are at the level where their conscience is singing, enjoying the, the presence of the Lord, enjoying the things of the Lord, is their conscience at level 10. We pray, Father, that you know where each one of our conscience and our spirit man development is. We pray, Father, that you will put the joy of salvation back into each life. That we, Father, will enjoy walking with the Lord, enjoy reading the Word, enjoy the wonders of Christianity, enjoy the, the things that you have told us to do, Father. And not just do something because we know it's right, but we miserably don't like it, but we do it because it's just right. We pray, Father, that our conscience will be stronger than level 3, level 4, level 5. That our conscience will find the true joy and the meaning of this consciousness of God. So bless each one here with a spirit of joy and replace the spirit of heaviness with the garments of praise and worship. Bless each one. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap. All praise God. Bless you. I see you.